Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Time to Improve Your ED Throughput, Six Effective Strategies Across the Patient Experience. My name is Amy Johnson and in just a moment we'll be joined by our presenters. If you have any questions that you would like to submit for the question and answer at the end of the webinar, click on the icon with the question mark and type in your question at any point throughout the webinar. We'll gather these questions and try to address as many as time permits at the end of the session. If we don't get to your question, we will follow up with an email to you one-on-one. -on -one. We will have a recorded version of this session in the event that you want to go back and review the material, or if you want to share the pre presentation with a colleague who is unable to attend. I will distribute the recording of this event to all attendees. Leading our discussion today is Dr. Maureen Anderson and Cheryl Graff. Dr. Anderson is a practicing physician at William Beaumont Hospital in Troy, Michigan, and a physician consultant for T-System. She provides input and strategy for new services and solutions designed to enhance the performance of emergency departments. She also works with clients to help them leverage our products to optimize clinical quality and efficiency. Cheryl is a nurse practitioner that currently works at four client sites and is a client relationship executive for the T-System. She has worked at the T-System for five years and has 25 years of ED practice in Washington. And now to kick off our presentation, here's Maureen and Cheryl. Good morning, or good day, everyone. And welcome back to those of you who joined us for part one. Uh, as you may know, we divided this talk into uh, two areas. One was choosing an emergency department information system, and one was using it to improve process. Obviously, these are arbitrary separations because the two are, or at least should be, well integrated. When you're choosing an EDIS, you want to have your workflow in mind and make sure that it supports it. When you're looking at process improvement, you want to be looking at how you can maximally leverage all this great technology uh, to help you perform as well as possible. So for those of you who were with us last time, you may remember that uh, low throughput time has very negative implications for patients and the hospital. In terms of safety, longer waits increase morbidity. We talked about the study where patients with MIs uh, in areas that were on uh, diversion had a much higher morbidity and mortality. Patient satisfaction is obviously the a very big driver of your success and, and future uh, volumes. And one dissatisfied patient can produce havoc in your referral base. There's a study that showed 75 out of 100 dissatisfied patients talked to their friends who then talked to their friends, and it ultimately impacted 465 potential patients. And then obviously there's a revenue impact. Each time a patient walks out the door, that's three to five hundred dollars worth of revenue. Each ambulance diverted, over three thousand dollars worth of revenue. So we want to make sure that our processes are as smooth as possible so that we can get patients in and out, keep them satisfied, keep them safe, keep them coming back if needed. Everything that's happening in the healthcare world now is also impacting our wait times. Healthcare reform is certainly an impact, and I don't want to get too political. I know the election is coming. However, uh, increasing the number of insured patients doesn't necessarily mean that those patients are going to have the appropriate access. So this may very well uh, cause an increase in ED volumes. Meaningful use is promoting electronic health record adoption, but we all know that there are a number of electronic health records out, th out there that do not necessarily support ED process, so that can negatively impact our wait times. ICD-10 is coming down the pike, requiring a huge amount of specificity for diagnoses in order to get reimbursed. This is going to impact documentation time uh, so that uh, to ensure that the proper elements of the diagnosis are included so that you can code and bill appropriately. And then, of course, accountable care organizations have a focus of keeping patients in the network, which increases our discharge processing time so that we make sure that we're getting the right patient to the right setting. But with 
If we have the right strategies, we can provide evidence-based, efficient, and compassionate care. So that's what we're here to talk about today. Obviously, this is a very short discussion. We're going to be giving you a, a high-level overview of some strategies that we've encountered. As you know, we're in 1900 EDs. We've seen a lot of unique and innovative approaches to patient care that others could benefit from. So we'll just touch on a few of these today, pique your interest, give you some food for thought, and we're always available to give you more information if needed. Obviously, if you improve throughput, the major impact is on quality and patient satisfaction, but there are significant revenue uh, improvements as well. So this is looking at a study where there was a 50,000 annual patient visit ED with an average length of stay of 200 minutes. Physician group was billing $100 per patient. The facility was billing $500 per ED visit and three to $7,000 per admission. When they reduced their length of stay by 60 minutes, they had 50,000 hours of increased ED capacity, so didn't have to add any rooms or any space. Just by moving patients through more quickly, they had increased capacity. So that left the uh, potential for 21,000 new visits, which would be an increase in physician revenue of $2.1 million and an increase in facility revenue of $8.6 million and $13 million for admitted patients. So you see that you can significantly uh, impact your ED operations if you are able to improve some of your processes. As we know, ED care is a process, it's a journey, and there are several points at which you can make an impact. And, and Cheryl will tell you, and certainly the sites that she's worked at, little tiny incremental changes can all add up to make a, a significant impact. So today we're going to talk about strategies uh, that address various points along this continuum. One thing to keep in mind is benchmark, benchmarking. In order to know where you want to go, you, you want to know what's out there, what, what are the standards. There are benchmarks in various locations on the internet, ENA has some good ones. We've started posting some benchmarks on our website because we have data from several hundred clients that we're now starting to put, put together and publish. You want to make sure that the benchmarks apply to your particular setting, of course. And the bottom line is the benchmarks are a nice goal post, but all you're looking for is incremental improvement. Okay, so the first strategy really comes before you even reach the emergency department, and that is redirecting patients to the most appropriate settings. And Cheryl, I'm going to turn this one over to you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. I was going to say on the previous slide, everyone, too, I think it's, a, it's very important to know where you're at um, currently, because it's difficult to know where you're heading if you don't know where you've been and where you are currently at. So I spend a lot of time um, like I am this week with a client, helping them understand where they're at and then understanding their particular goals, their mission to know where they want to go. So focus on where you're at as well. And if you're not collecting benchmarks or collecting your overall stats about uh, different metrics in your emergency department, that would be a primary place to begin. So when we talk about these, this continuum of care, we look at some of the pre-ED um, things that we can do. I work with sites with sim simple, simple metrics, like posting where they want an ambulance to uh, take a patient when the patient arrives. It's very time consuming if the ambulance paramedic shows up and they have no idea what room to take the patient to. That can tie up staff time of three people finding out where the charge nurse wants the patient. So I've asked all of my hospitals to post a tracking board right in their ambulance bay so that when the patient um, arrives by ambulance, they can see go to room seven or go to room 11. There um, are some really great initiatives going on across the country. I was at a meeting in uh, Texas a few months ago and we found out 
that some hospitals in the Texas region are actually uh, dispatching um, paramedics and uh, mid-level providers, PAs, nurse practitioners, out to a patient's site when the patient calls 911 to assess, does that patient really need to be in the emergency department today or can they be, um, can they be taken care of in their own home care environment? That's a way to keep patients in your own healthcare network. I, my husband's a paramedic and I brought this information from that meeting back and they're exploring it in the county in Washington uh, where he works. Could they add that to their protocols? So there's really some unique things that um, hospitals can do. A couple of my clients, they actually own their ambulance service through the hospitals. I have a rural eastern Washington site I work with and they're looking at um, doing some things in the field keep patients out of the ED, because sometimes bringing a patient in the ED can cost a lot of money. Anything you wanted to add to this, Dr. Anderson? Well, the, others, uh, the other strategies are that there are indeed mobile units going to neighborhoods to act as a, a little bit of an urgent care uh, to take care of patients right in their own neighborhoods. And then, of course, we'll be talking more about this, but uh, providers at triage to, to perform medical screening exams and triage them directly to clinics rather than having them go through the emergency department. Uh, that's a strategy that's being utilized at a number of places as well. I do that in one of the large Washington sites if I'm assigned to the triage. Um, I'm really practicing medicine in the waiting room, which does include sometimes sending patients back to their doctor's office. Right, and people have different levels of comfort with that. that. That has to be very well scripted and supported by protocols, but it can be very effective. Uh, this is an example of some pre-hospital technology that can be leveraged. Uh, you, patients can actually get onto their iPhones if they have them and look to see what the length of stay is at the various emergency departments. Studies have shown that People who use this technology actually will go to the emergency department with the shortest length of stay. And what that does is uh, it decompresses some of those that have the longer length of stay so that they can work on the patients that they do have. One of the sites that I work with, one of the paper sites that I work with uh, in Washington, we actually started about eight or nine months ago. We noticed all of our patients on their iPhones and instead of asking them to turn off their phones, which patients really don't do, we started looking at the iTriage um, application that can be downloaded for free on an iPhone, and we started helping patients actually keep track of their um, meds and allergies so that they could have that with them. We always wanted a patient to have a list. Well, you can put that right into the iTriage, and we've just started a new initiative in the last few weeks where we're actually showing the patients in the eye triage application, some medical information. So if they have an ankle sprain, we can show them how to go right to the ankle sprain and read more information. So it's a supplement to the discharge instructions that we are giving patients on, on their discharge. And our whole goal is we just want patients to be knowledgeable about their health care. Right. And, and the other way that this can be used is you can actually do a pre-pre-registration. So you see this, you know, tell us you're coming in. So you can actually pre-notify the emergency department uh, when you're coming in, so patient, so EDs have a record of who might be coming. And so indeed that's one of the strategies uh, th that we like to talk about when we're trying to shorten up that very first portion of the ED care, the arrival and triage process. So there's patient pre-notification through things like iTriage and, and other applications. Uh, there's quick registration where a minimal amount of uh, information is connect, uh, collected initially just to get the patient into the system, and then registration goes back later to do the full registration. Rapid triage where, again, minimal amount of information is collected. You know, are you vertical or horizontal? Are you red, white, or blue? And uh, that helps with placement of the patient, and, and more expanded triage can be done later. Provider at triage uh, is a big one, uh, whether that's a mid-level or a physician. Uh, patients pulled to open beds is a strategy that many people like to use because they, at the end of the day, they just want to get the patient to the back and get them to the provider back, back there. 
A new one that's getting a lot of traction is this vertical patients remain vertical. So if you come in fully clothed, walking, skipping, there is no need to unclothe you and strap you down into a bed where you can languish for hours watching TV or on your computer. You can stay vertical. We can, you can be assessed. You can have the proper labs and diagnostic imaging ordered right at triage, and then you can go back into your vertical position of sitting or standing, either in the waiting room or in an internal lab room. And then using order sets and protocols is very important, and that is whether it's diagnostic testing that you're using these for or whether you are using these protocols in order to determine who gets sent to the back, who gets sent to clinic, et cetera. The, uh, the protocol and the standardization helps increase your efficiency. And sure. several of the EDs um, that I either visit or work in, all, I'll give you an example. All extremity, lower extremity injuries never leave a wheelchair. And then when they're ready for splinting, we have one hallway bed that's open. We put the patient on their tummy and we splint them up. And so the patient, once they come in, they really do their care in a wheelchair. And it has freed up, um, think of all the extremity injuries that come into the ED, it's really freed up a lot of bed space so that we can get patients who need to lay down laying down. Yeah, and many places now are have created these internal lab radiology results waiting rooms. So they, they have patients briefly in a room for exam. The tests are ordered and collected, and then they go to another area in a chair usually sometimes a nice recliner, whatever, to await their results. And this really frees up the space for the people who need it. I think as well, when you get a certain volume in your ED, having the ability to have a private area within the waiting room to draw labs and collect urine can also be a time saver. So when the patient does make it back to the provider, the labs and the, and the uh, urine results are already resulted back and ready. Yes, I believe, didn't you say, Cheryl, we've had a, a few clients where they have just screened up a small portion of the waiting room for that function. They haven't had to actually add any space. They've just utilized their space differently. Just put up a little curtain in the plant to create some privacy. <laughs> All right. So here's an example of uh, Grady Health System in Atlanta who, who created a fast track system. And basically, you know, it's just what we talked about. Patients with acute but non-life-threatening conditions uh, were able to be treated more quickly and released. Patients were sorted by status and what kind of services they were going to need. Were they going to need labs, x-rays, IVs? Uh, that kind of determined where they went. And then the mid-level or nurse practitioner or nurse uh, were very engaged in making sure that the tests were collected up front. So what they found was a two-hour reduction in fast track throughput which is usually typically already pretty fast, but one-third increase in productivity, 50% decrease in average time from arrival to bed placement, and 19% decrease in average time from bed placement to initial exam. So this is not just theory. People are putting these principles into practice and doing it very successfully. All right, door to doctor, this is a big topic these days, we all know that the uh, arrival to provider time or time to provider TTP is the big interval for patient satisfaction and for safety. Uh, so we want to make sure that that is as short as possible. So what happens is that the treatment begins immediately upon arrival. The patient is assessed right up in a triage area, labs are ordered diagnostic imaging is ordered. If they can be treated and treated, as we say, without any intervention, that happens right up front. They don't go to the back to clog up the beds. Uh, if, if they need to go back to a bed, they are placed immediately in a bed and the provider examines them. It does represent a big culture change. For those of us who have been around for decades, I won't say how many, we were used to a certain rhythm. They walk in, they wait, they get triaged, they wait, they go back to a bed, they wait, they get seen by a physician. You know, so we are used to a certain rhythm and that all has to change as well as the focus changing. I'm 
it's, it's not about my convenience as a provider, it's about what is best for the patient and what will get them through the quickest and most, uh, most safely. So the bottom line is the metrics can improve with this approach. Uh, sites have reduced their time to provider from 10 to 80 minutes. Obviously, patients are more satisfied. There's increased revenue for both hospital and provider. But every department must own the process. So that's not only the emergency department, but that's lab and radiology, all your ancillary support services. Cheryl, are you in any uh, sites where you're doing rapid uh, medical evaluation? Yes, I am, and it's a pretty large site. They see about 56,000 patients a year. So that mid-level that works at um, triage, I would say about a quarter of the patients, 25% of them, they never even make it to the back. We pop in, they got a sore throat, we do the evaluation, we write the prescription. A new thing they're trying at that site, too, is doing registration um, post. So um, on those quick, rapid medical eval patients that can be discharged, we actually hand their script to and their discharge instructions to a registration clerk, and then the patient actually does the registration on the back end. So again, that we can get the patient to the provider quicker. So it's working very nicely. Yes, and, and I, I agree I, with you, Dr. Anderson. It's a hard rhythm for the doctors, the mid-levels, and the staff to give up. But once we work together and we give up those old rhythms, we can really see patients um, much quicker and much more efficiently. I agree. Uh, now, I have also uh, worked in a model with physician at triage. And the other benefit to that is you have your own team. There's a nurse, there's a tech, there's a provider. And so you're able to quickly prioritize how you want to utilize those resources. Sometimes in the back, if you're not set up in a team approach, then you're competing with your other providers who want the same resources. And the support staff don't exactly know how to prioritize necessarily. So it's nice when you have a team approach so that you can work together to determine how best to approach all of the uh, things that need to be done for, to evaluate and discharge patients. I think in hindsight, too, the two sites have actually physically experienced this change. One site did some retraining for the nursing staff, um, teaching them kind of a different methodology for rapid triage, teaching them how to do simple things like assess ankles with the Ottawa rules. That site had a very nice transition. The site that did not engage the nursing staff had a very poor adoption, poor transition. So I think involving your nursing staff and maybe looking at redoing a triage training can be very helpful. That's a good point. And, and in fact, we talked about this a little bit in choosing an EDIS, but whenever you're doing any sort of change, you must engage the people who are involved. It, it never goes well. I'm sure you've all experienced this at one point or another in your careers. It doesn't go well when you say, okay, we're going to do this. And if it's not clear to the people engaged what's in it for them and what's in it for patients, then it does not go well and you, you get people trying to undermine the process. So your team needs to be very focused, very positive, very committed, and very persistent uh, in order for any of these changes to, to be successful. So here's some rapid medical evaluation case studies. So here's a 99-bed acute care facility, decreased its time to provider to eight minutes, and increased its press gainy patient satisfaction percentile from 25th to 85th percentile. It's pretty dramatic. <laughs> and then uh, with, uh, at another site, with the addition of bedside registration wireless, they reduced their time to provider from 100 to less than 40 minutes. Another one, after re-engineering the front end process, uh, there was a 75% decrease in time to provider from 100 to 25 minutes. And then the last one we have here, uh, by creating the uh, RME team, the CD team found its uh, time to provider decreased more than 70%, its LWS percentage reduced by 55% and diversion hours diminished by 75%. So these are some significant changes that you can affect by adopting some of these strategies. Doctor to decision. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about bedside 
documentation. This is really becoming more and more accepted by providers and by patients. It is the most efficient way to conduct the visit. You are documenting as you're seeing the patient. T-System, of course, makes it very easy, but other people do it with other adjuncts, such as scribes. Uh, there, are, there are physicians that are nervous about having a computer in front of the patient. They say that the patient are, is going to think that it's depersonalized and uh, that you're spending more time on the computer than you are with them. However, that can be circumvented with the proper scripting. When you engage the patient in the technology, they actually get very excited. And when you're able to place orders right from the room so that the, by the time you finish, the portable chest x-ray machine is rolling in, or of course the dilaudid is rolling in, you're making your patients very happy and very excited about the technology. The other thing is they're so relieved that they're not having to present their information multiple times. You're able to pull up a nursing note and just verify. Or better yet, you're able to have the physician and nurse in there at the same time collecting the information. Have any thoughts on that, Cheryl? I think it absolutely works very, very well. And I engage all my patients that um, certainly can be engaged. Maybe the little old lady with Alzheimer's can't engage, but then I would engage their family. And I agree with you, Dr. Anderson, scripting is important. So I like to just turn this screen. I have a convertible laptop where I can turn the screen. And I'll just say, you know, Sally told me last time that she had all these past medical history items. Can we just validate them together? Patients love it. They absolutely love it. Right, they know that you know a bit about them. And one thing to note about hardware, one size does not fit all. So some people may be very comfortable with a tablet and a stylus tapping on, on the appropriate uh, verbiage. Others may want to use a rolling laptop or computers in the rooms. Part of what influences this is, of course, your physical space. Tablets work very well in small places because you can bring them in, bring them out. Uh, workstations on wheels, wows we call them now, take up, they can be fairly bulky. On the other hand, they can be fairly robust too. You can have, you know, scanners, printers, whatever you want on them if registration wants to do that at the bedside. People do worry about security with tablets. We have found, I was at Henry Ford, obviously, in, in the Detroit area, and, and we just put a, a tag on the tablet and so that if the tablet walked out of the emergency department, we would have an alert. But there's a number of ways you can handle that as well. You can put a, a cable from the tablet to just an IV stand so that the, the tablet can't really walk out in somebody's pocket. It's just attached to an IV stand. So there's various ways you can handle that. But you do want to be able to place orders at the bedside. That's a huge patient satisfier, as well as obviously improved care because you're decreasing the interval between patient evaluation and, and order placement. So this patient handoff process is becoming more and more uh, is raising is coming to the forefront. It's certainly something that uh, government and healthcare reform uh, support and insist on. In the back in the day, we gave the patient a prescription and said farewell. And uh, now it's very important to connect them to the right setting. It's important if you're in a ACO to keep them in the in the setting of your ACO. So this discharge piece becomes a lot more complex, which can take more time, so, but there's, there's technology around that will support this, and I think Cheryl's gonna talk a little bit about this. One of the sites that I'm working at currently, they, they are part of a large healthcare system, and they're looking at the patients that are uninsured that are using the ED with high frequency, so they decided that they wanted to target that population. And one of the things that they're looking at is if they connect those patients to a primary care doctor or a clinic that is accepting new referral patients, will those patients continue to bounce back? So that led to how can we make that connection so that it's not labor intensive? 
One of our modules that they're looking at is our care continuity module, which allows for some automated patient handoff um, down the continuum, the stream of care. So I'll be anxious to see over the next six months as we evaluate that at this site, will that help those patients not bounce back? And it's not that we don't want to see patients that are uninsured. We want to be able to see those patients in the right setting in the ED. Coming in 19 times a year for dental pain or chronic back pain or headaches, that's poor utilization of the services in a community. So um, if anyone down the road would like to take a look at some of our care continuity materials, I'd love to be able to show you that. But it's a, it's a nice, quick, easy way for staff to engage patient in the referral process. Yeah, this, this has been, has generated quite a bit of interest as the requirements come down the pike. And uh, the nice thing about this is whether you're a paper client or an EV client or a client of someone else, this, this kind of technology can really help you in the discharge process. All right, so the last strategy is realigning your staffing to peak times. Now we all think that we know when patients are coming in, but when you actually use the technology to look at the arrival times, you're, you're quite, you're often surprised and people are peak, you know, the peaks are coming much earlier in the day than you think and the valleys are coming at different times than you think. And it's really important to know exactly what's going on in your department so that you can leverage your staffing appropriately. Uh, Cheryl? I think the other thing too is I've spent what I would call intimate time with 25 of our clients this year in my territory that I cover in the Northwest. And this is one of the areas I cover with them every time I visit, how's your staffing going? And there isn't a single client that I find isn't a little bit behind the eight ball. So they think that their peak time is noon to 10 p.m., but they're not increasing their staffing until maybe noon, and there's seven patients behind in the waiting room. What I find is it doesn't matter if you're a small site that sees 5,000 patients a year through your ED or you're a big site seeing 70,000 patients, it's all relative. Five patients behind the eight ball in a small site could crush your day versus 15 in a large site. So really having that just-in-time information to be able to say where are we really at and to be taking that information and trending it so that you can really have um, a better staffing plan. Every single one of my sites has readjusted their staffing plan when they start really looking at their peak times. So again, we have a great uh, module in T-System called STAT, EV STAT, and it pulls data out of your T-System module and it allows you to really look at things like what is your patient inflow, your throughput, your outflow, and you can really get a chance to see where are your bottlenecks in the ED. And if you don't address bottlenecks, you can make all the changes in the world, but those, bottle, but those bottlenecks will remain if you identify them wrong. So for example, if you typically have your census bump at noon and you're bringing in a new nurse, the chances are you'll never recuperate all day with your staffing. You'll just be continually running behind, behind. But if you were to bring your staffing in at 11 and you never let that bottleneck of, of patients piling up in the waiting room, then you may be able to stay ahead of the curve. So there's lots of strategies there. And again, our stat module would be a great module if anybody would like to see it. Um, we'd, be happy, we'd be happy to show you that. All right, thank you, Cheryl. So as you can see, Technology can can be your friend or your enemy, and uh, what we want to make sure is that it's your friend and that it's the patient's friend, that it supports excellent and timely care. We, we You want to make sure that your technology is facilitating care and not impeding it. Uh, there are lots of applications and, and, and software and uh, technology advancements out there that can really help you. Uh, it's, it's important to, to look at your processes, where you are now, where you want to go, and uh, look at what you need technology to support, and you will find it. Uh, so now we have a few minutes for questions, if you have any. Yes, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to type them into the question and answer section. We do have one. It is, what if, what if we don't have the bandwidth or resources to implement these strategies? All right, well, well go ahead. 
Yeah, I was just going to say that many of our strategies uh, for our EV clients, such as our stat and our continuity, take little to no IT resources. And the clients that I take care of and um, look after in my territory, they, they typically have very small IT departments, maybe one or two people working, and, and so that's a legitimate concern. So many of our solutions require very little IT bandwidth. Um, most of the solutions, again, just like our EV products for documentation, they're very intuitive and very easy to use. So I don't find that to be a, a challenge in the sites that I, I take care of. And Dr. Anderson, what about some of the sites you work with? Well, uh, what I was going to say is uh, well, a little bit of reiteration of what you said. Uh, not only do our products not require a lot of support, but many of these strategies don't require two teams of people. You just want to have people who are focused and committed. But in addition to that, we have in our company expertise from all these 1,900 sites, and we have subject matter experts that we can link you with either to assess what the issue is or to recommend solutions or to even we can link you with people who can actually even go in and implement for you and, and be your project management team. So we have lots of ways that we can support you uh, in this process. Great. We do have a couple other questions. So um, here's one. I'd like to know more about the post-registration process. Who and when are the are the discharge instructions gone over with the patient? So I can talk about it from the site I work at. If I'm discharging the patient as the mid-level or if the nurse is discharging, we still go over those with the patient, um, answer their questions. But instead of handing the paperwork and the prescription to the patient, we walk the patient up to the registration, hand the paper to the registration. When the registration is completed, then, um, then the patient is handed their materials. But it's reviewed still by either the nurse or the, the mid-level provider. And we've set up a very defined uh, process and when we kick into that, that mode. So it works really nice. The other thing that in this one particular ED that I'm working with, they implemented it. And they're also finding that they're getting better and more complete registration so that they can actually bill for their services. Okay, our other question is, does T-System integrate with Meditech? Yes, yes, yes. Now, what you have to remember is integrate is a term that's thrown around quite loosely, so you have to really uh, be clear about what, what you're talking about. But there are several levels. You know, there's registration, there's labs, uh, lab ordering, lab retrieval, meds and allergies, bi-directional uh, flow, et cetera. I can tell you this, that... Uh, just about half of our electronic clients are Meditech clients, so we are very well versed in the interfaces with Meditech. Um, okay, now somebody's asking how can we obtain a copy of this presentation. I will um, tomorrow. I'll, I will email you guys the, a copy of the uh, slides and a recording of the presentation, so you can have everything um, to go over. And they're always posted on our client portal, so you can look at any past webinar that we have provided, and there's some excellent ones there as well as some other excellent client resources. So our client portal um, is a great resource, and if you don't know how to access the portal, um, you can certainly um, email any of us, and we'd be happy to walk you through that. Um, also, one more question. If I wanted to have T-System help my ED, how would I get this arranged? Well, if you're a, if you're a T-System electronic um, uh, client, you're using EV in your ED, you all have a client manager, and you all have a client relationship executive, somebody like me, maybe not me, but is assigned to your site. So that would be a good starting point, and we could assess what your need is. And then, Maureen, you're, Dr. Anderson, you're part of the um, clinical excellence um, Spencer, would you maybe briefly talk about that and what we have available? Right. We, we again, have decided that or have realized that in addition to all of our software offerings, we have all this expertise and wisdom, uh, you know, collected from working with so many clients over the years. And so we really wanted to harness that and turn around and offer it to to others, either current clients or potential clients. And so... We do have a number of service offerings, and 
certainly analysis of ED workflow, analysis and optimization of ED workflow is, is uh, among those offerings, as is education and some other things. So uh, what I would do, again, if you're not a client, is, is go through the website and ask the question, and we can connect you with the proper people. Okay, does iTriage interface a patient meds and allergies and insurance into each facility's T system? Not at this point. It is something that we've talked about that would be really cool if they could just enter the information at home and then have it flow into EV upon arrival. Uh, and we're actually looking at some other uh, applications that have the potential to do that as well, but we're not quite there yet. Okay, that's all the questions we have right now, so we'll just give it a minute or two, just a minute or so, and see if you guys have any more questions. Uh, if not, I will be sending everything out tomorrow, so if you come up with a question during the day today and want to just reply, reply to my email tomorrow, we will get your question answered for you. While we're waiting for to see if there's any other questions, thank you, Amy. Um, I, I always encourage my clients to um, connect with other T-System clients in their area because clients learn a lot about best practice from each other. And if you don't know who the T-System clients in your region are, again, that would be a great thing to ping your client manager and uh, we could certainly um, hook you up. All of my clients know each other in my region and sometimes they actually reach out to each other and learn on a daily basis. So I, I do encourage that. So. Let us know if you don't know who people are in your region, and we can help with that. And that's a good point. And the other resource we have, of course, is our annual uh, user conference. And that is a really fun gathering of current clients. And there's a lot of sharing of best practices and unique ways in which they're using our products to support their, their processes. Okay, well, I think uh, that's all the questions. So thank you guys so much for joining today's session, and thank you, Dr. Anderson and Cheryl. Um, we just hope you guys have a great day. Thank you very much, Amy. Bye. Bye, Thanks, all. everybody.